Um, I'm, I mean, I was slightly nervous about this being filmed because, um, you know, first of all, there's my millions of YouTube fans who will um, need you to be watching this. But the second thing is, I, I really tended to sort of quite a knockabout paper that's sort of full of um, pretty like half assertions assertions and so on. And uh, if, if anything that you think I'm saying is sort of interesting or provocative, I'd rather you read um, some of the stuff I've read, particularly some of the on Foucault, where I think I try and develop these arguments in more kind of serious and, and you know, a way that's actually referenced and, you know, has got some backing. Uh, probably a lot of what I'm going to say today you might think is, is um, rather uh, difficult to sum up, perhaps. Um, so I come, I come with, a fair, with a fairly sort of pessim pessimistic message. Even though I don't really know that much about sociology of education, I'm going to guess, or education at all, really, I'm going to guess that the situation of education is a bit like what it is in two disciplines I know reasonably well, which is psychology and sociology, which is that social theory is dead. It's, um, it's been consigned uh, to the margins at, at, the, at the very best, I suppose, and it possibly contributes to the self-image of these disciplines, but frankly, they make no, no use of theory, and, you know, other than in terms of their public image. And um, uh, social theory, I think, really has retreated to what's probably its, its best home, I think, which is the humanities in, in, discipline, in other disciplines aside from the social sciences. So I think the problem for most of the social sciences, as, as I see it, is that theory is, has died or uh, really just plays a kind of a decorative, a decorative role. So I'll try and, um, I'll try and expand on that. Um, OK, so... Um, See. Uh, my, my colleague and, and friend Kirsten Harley who works at the University of Sydney has been doing some interesting work on what's taught in sociology departments and degrees around Australia and her findings are, are quite striking really which is that many sociology departments have actually completely given up on social theory. Uh, sociology has become what you might call kind of a normal science really. People are just doing, um, you know, they're just kind of getting on with uh, correlating uh, collecting data, and then there's kind of a, a you know surface veneer of like you know the theoretical edifice that might make this worthwhile. But generally speaking, it's a kind of a normal science endeavour where people are just collecting lots of data, and then that's kind of what they teach under the rubric like know, sociology of deviance or economic sociology or um, you know gender or whatever it might be. Um, that these these sub bits of sociology are really just taught um, uh, in terms of the kind of the facts that are derived from a whole series of surveys and mostly quantitative data. Um, the history, I think, of why sociology did, you know, kind of lost its contact with social theory, uh, it goes back at really quite a, quite a long way. I mean, I think it goes back at least to the 1930s in the US and possibly really strongly after the war in the US. Um, I think what started to happen was so sociology became uh, a, a proper discipline and there were, there were benefits to that. Course, but the, the problem I think with it is, is it kind of locked sociology into to a kind of a groove that it began to no longer be able to see outside of that groove. The early sociologists, actually, or people we think of as sociologists, were all Renaissance, you know, scholars. I mean, people like Weber, Durkheim, and Marx. Those are the kinds of careers they had, where you know they either weren't in academia or they were moving between economics, law, anthropology, sociology. You know, people like Zimmel and so on. This kind of um, this kind, of a, this kind of background where uh, there, there was no specialisation, I suppose, led to, I think, a kind of golden age of sociological theorising. But it was killed, really, I think, not least by a dis uh, the, the growth of sociology of discipline, particularly, particularly in America from about, you know, particularly because I think of people like Parsons who were very strongly, um, uh, you know, argued for, for a kind of disciplinary and scientific disciplinary foundation for sociology. Increasing specialisation as well, what began to happen was that sociologists began to see themselves not, not necessarily just as sociologists, but as sociologists, deviants, economic sociologists, cultural sociologists, or whatever it might be. And, and again, this deep, deep specialisation meant that they lost contact with anthropological thinking, or whatever it might um, The disciplines began to employ sociologists in those particular positions. So now if you look at jobs for sociologists, they never, you know, they're not, they don't want a favour. They, they wouldn't want a marks. I mean, that, those people would be unemployable in sociology marks. They were a really boring person who runs surveys on, um, you know, some aspect of a time bit of sociology that might be seen as, you know, important for the new age that we live in. You know, that is. 
Uh, vocationalism has been a problem as well because these disciplines began to give employment to sociologists in, particular, in these particular narrow roles. So the sorts of people who were churned out of sociology departments were no longer babies and dirt kinds. They were, you know, at, at, at my students here, I'll see Don go back. You know, what happens is we churn, we churn out like really very boring people who have no idea about <laughs> sociolog sociological theory. They, they, they specialise, you know, and, as, and, it, and of course, you know, the whole thing of doing the PhD and so on exacerbates this problem. One of the worst ones I suspect is that sociology, like many um, social science disciplines which wanted to be um, you know, taken seriously, went down a kind of scientific model. And as competitive funding came in, and particularly in the, in the US, the Rockefeller Foundation, I think, was really responsible for this shift, what began to happen was that funding was attached to projects which could cure social problems. You probably know, you know, Parsons made these bizarre claims in the US. He actually got, I think he got the biggest ever social science grant in today's money. It was absolutely millions and millions of dollars to eliminate crime. And he seriously said, you know, this is what will happen. Crime will be eliminated at the end of this three-year project. Which is, you know, a good, a kind of really great thing if you're writing ARC applications. Like, that. come and look at Parsons' applications if you want to go for the real you know, this will really change the world. Now, what happened with Rockefeller funding, massive funding, was that the Rockefeller funding was always attached, always began to attack, attach to the solving of specific social problems, which in a sense made it really very dull. You know, it was kind of like, what's the, what's the biggest quantitative survey study that we can do that will throw light on this problem? And as I'm sure most of you know, you know, these massive American surveys actually contributed virtually nothing to our knowledge of the world. Uh, you know, you're, to borrow a phrase from Stephen Turner, You'll, you'll get more from a, a kind of a neglected paragraph in Zimmel than you will from pretty much every big US social survey ever conducted. So that's, that's the kind of historical reason, I think, for the death of social theory and sociology. There's also kind of a, a modern, um, uh, what's the word, kind of, there's a sort of modern feeling, I think, which is that social theory, and, this, and, and so what I'm arguing I guess, is that social theory is in a sense being, just being destroyed from the inside. Uh, people like Ulrich Beck, for instance, argue, argue that sociology is now full of zombie concepts. By that he means what we're doing is we're working with, we're working with sociological theories and theoretical concepts which no longer apply to the modern age. Um, you know, this is, I think this is absolutely you know, arrogant nonsense, really. It's just Beck's uh, efforts to kind of justify himself as a, an incredibly novel theorist. Um, so there's this kind of cry, which is very common, I think, in, in, in where social theory is still attached to departments, is that what we must do is we must throw away sociological theory and we must reinvent it. So it's kind of been eaten from, from both ends. I, I think, I mean, I've probably got time to go into this, but I think you know, one of the reasons Beck is wrong is that um, it, it seems reasonably clear that the world hasn't actually changed that much since the major sociological concepts, theoretical concepts were, were invented or, or were, were generated. I think um, the two major, what you might call, data points which led to the generation of sociology were urbanisation and the French Revolution. And they led to particular sorts of you know, cognate problems. They're problems about um, you know, the nature of identity in the city, um, you know, the impact of um, you know, changes, in the, the changes in the nation, nation state, relations between the nation state and so on. Um, the question of um, uh, kind of human morality in society, all these kinds of things. Um, these kinds of questions, I think, are exactly the same questions we face today. It's, it's not as if anything has really, has really changed that much. I think, again, to borrow from Stephen Turner, Stephen Turner says sociology is in the same situation as something like politics. We don't have to completely reinvent political theory because the political problems we face are exactly the same as the problems we faced in 1900. I mean, look, exactly, it's perhaps a bit too... I'm exaggerating, but they're basically the same sorts of problems. So I think it's the same in sociology. I don't actually think the world is that different from the, the world that was the modern world that was invented um, on the 1st of January 1800. <laughs> so, sorry, my thing keeps turning on, so I have to keep coming back to this. So um, theory theory has begun to take really quite a subordinate role in spite of you know Kant's famous assertion that you can have theory without data and vice versa, are a waste of time. Um, I think Kant's the, you know, one of the great originators of this myth. 
And in fact, what one, co one constantly sees is this idea that really good social sciences where theory and empirical data collection are you know, joined together very closely, they constantly talk to each other. Um, I suspect this, I think this is a myth. One of the reasons I think it's a myth is if you look at sociology, actually, theorists and empirical data collection people don't read each other's work, they never talk to each other, they have no influence on each other's uh, projects. As someone who mostly reads Foucault, I can't remember the last time I read a, a, an empirical sociology study. Only really when I've been a journal editor and I've been forced to because <laughs> something's coming in and you think, oh shit, I've got to read this. <laughs> um, and, and I think the other way around, the empirical people are not in the least bit interested in arguments around Durkheim or Foucault or Bourdieu or whatever. They're just getting on with it. They're just getting on with the uh, correlation of, of um, variables. Um, so I don't actually think theory and empirical on the ground, I don't actually think theory and empirical data collection uh, do inform each other, and actually nor should they. They really are separate disciplines. In fact, it's, it's very interesting, if you, look at some, if you look at the bibliometric data, which kind of tries to, to look at the extent to which various subcategories and categories cohere, uh, whether you can actually say that there, there are actually disciplines in existence, the bibliometricians kind of argue that sociology really was dead by 1980. There was no core set of concepts around which all of sociology revolved. What it had devolved to by the 1980s was just a series of, um, not exactly cults, but you know, separate groupings who had their own concerns. So the idea that theory and empirical data talk to each other, I think, is not true in, in sociology. It's certainly not true in psychology. Um, I used to teach in a psychology department where I used to teach uh, theory to students. It was a completely, complete waste of time. I mean, there's, there's no need for it, really. Um, there's a little bit to be said for teaching psychologists history, but they don't need theory. It's absolutely a normal science. All the theoretical questions are kind of solved. What they're just doing is collecting data about um, you know, whatever it is in their sub their subdiscipline, cognitive, developmental, neuro, whatever it might be. Um, anyway, as you as you see in my abstract, I think you can you can you can kind of <coughs> divide socio sociological thinking. This, this kind of dying or dead theory happens to two sorts. There's, there's, um, there are basically the theorists who, re, who sort of are assume, assume a kind of godlike status where they look down on the, on the activities of ordinary mortals and tell us what that all means. And the other approach is kind of the other way around, where you sort of say, well, I have no idea what's going on here. What I must do is talk to the participants and let them uh, enable me to re-describe what's going on. So there, there are two... There are two types of, um, of theoretical approach in sociology. So the first one, I think, is you know is very is very clear from, for example, uh, Marxism. So, so what happens is that there are things, there are concepts like ideology or uh, you know the status of the economic infrastructure or um, class consciousness or whatever, which are which are concepts which are not available to ordinary folk. Uh, what the theorist does is is look at what's going on with ordinary folk in their lives, and then you kind of invent these descriptive categories which enable you to understand um, the meaning of, of life, political institutions, ordinary behaviour, and so on. So in this first concept, I think, this, this first way of doing theory, uh, the theorist is a kind of a godlike figure. And look, if you look at, say, I mean, it's really easy, I think, easy, so I think if you see, if you look at something like structuralism, across all the, all the human and social sciences, this, this model uh, obtains. So, you know, say, in, in um, linguistics, there's the idea, you know, via Jacobson and um, Saussure, there's this idea that we all have these rule systems for using language, but they're not actually available to us. So when I speak English, I'm not thinking subject, verb, object, adverb, and so on. You can eventually learn that later, but you, there's a kind of a rule system which governs your, your linguistic use, which is not available to you. And what it requires is a linguistic, a ling, linguist, 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 linguist mm -hmm. decision, linguists to come in and, and explain that category. Uh, two. Oh, yeah, similarly, in, in say um, developmental psychology, what Piaget does is, is say, well, there are these developmental stages which are kind of invisible to parents or children or whatever. But but looking at various behaviours of children, you can see that once they get to seven, they start doing this. Once they get to twelve, they start doing this. And so there are four stages of development or whatever. Um, and you know, similarly, Le you know, Levi Strauss argues about the kind of universal nature of kinship relations and, and so on. In psychoanalysis, people like Lacan do exactly the same thing, kind of universal structures which are kind of in, invisible to the participants, but which the data can, can kind of prod the theorists to discover. The, the second approach, I guess, is the kind of um, 
uh, you know, ethnographic, ethnomethodological approach. Um, so, so what you see here, oh sorry, I should say in terms of the first concept, you know, that's, I think that's really alive and well in things like globalisation studies, which is where, where globalisation is the kind of theoretical concept which organises the data which ordinary people can, can't tell what's going on. And, it, and that's, you know, the interesting thing about that is it's remarkably resilient to critique. Um, you may know the, the fantastic book by Paul Hurst and, and Graham Thompson called Globalisation in Question, which essentially said the whole story of globalisation in sociology is completely wrong, because actually there's much less globalisation now than there was in 1870. It's a really heavyweight book by two of the greatest kind of sociological and economic thinkers in Britain at the time, and it kind of got nowhere. And the reason it got nowhere was because what, you, what happens in this situation is that if the data doesn't fit, fit the theory, the theory doesn't change. People, people just ignore it. Or they say, uh, well, you know, there must be something wrong with your data. So, so entities like kind of globalisation studies are remarkably resilient. They actually don't need data for people to believe in globalisation. When Hurst and Thompson presented the data which showed that globalisation is a myth, or increasing globalisation is a myth, they were just ignored. Okay, so back to the back to the second one, which is the sort of um, the kind of ethnographic, ethnomethodological approach. So, as you probably know, what goes on here is there's this idea that, uh, let's say I'm, I'm an ethnomethodologist, I have no idea what's going on in the social world. What I have to do is get participants to show me, and then I generate a, a kind of a theory out of that. Nice, um, a nice modern example of that would be someone like Bruno Latour, who says, I have no idea what these people are doing. I'll follow them around and I'll let them tell me how their world works, and then I'll I'll re-describe it. Um, in, in a way, this is a very weak form of theory because especially if you look at something like ethnomethodology, its theoretical background is, is either, you know, is barely stated or is, is not really glossed very heavily. So there are occasional references in people like Goffman and Garfinkel to, you know, Hassel, um, Wittgenstein, Schultz and people like that. But there's no, there's no kind of deep engagement with, with um, theory. And actually, I'll simplify things in my abstract. I think there is a third way, which Paolo was asking me about. Is there a third, a third one? I didn't want to tell because I, <laughs> I wanted to have a little surprise here. So there is a third way, which is um, Robert Merton, who was one of the people who destroyed sociology along with Parsons in the, in, in the US. Um, in, you know, he was right to see there's a kind of a, a, kind of a problem here. And he, he, he went for a kind of what he called a middle, a middle ground, what he calls middle range theories. And the idea of this is, I think, that what you do is you don't always look for really big theory. What you try and do is you collect kind of, you know, little enclaves of data and little, you know, very limited, specific theoretical constructs which go with those small bits of data. So rather than Marx saying, this is how every society in the history of humanity works, you know, um, Merton will be much more likely to look at something quite, quite small, a specific... Uh, a, a very small area of, of um, human endeavour where you collect data on it and you generate these very small theories. So it's kind of mid, in the middle between just collect data. Well, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a middle between, I guess, the, the purely theoretical and purely quantitative, or at least that's the hope. So the idea here is that you, you collect data and you generate uh, theories which are not necessarily tied to kind of big picture theories. The, the downside of this is what happened, actually, is that Merton and his colleagues and people like um, Lazarsfeld what they did here was they, um, their theoretical presuppositions or, or, or pre theoretical findings were actually very light. And in fact, what this just turned into was, was a kind of um, uh, a carte blanche, really, for let's just collect as much data as possible. So Merton and his students didn't really develop theory in this middle range stuff. What they just did was went off and did variable correlation. Okay. Um, to a certain extent, I think there's a, there's a, you know, there's a circularity in, these, in both of these sorts of arguments. Um, you know, probably the first type of approach is that the only people who really get to judge the theory of the theoretical concept are the theorists. Um, and that's not necessarily subjected to any empirical scrutiny. It's, you know, it's most obvious in things like psychoanalysis, where you know, people believe in psychoanalysis. There's nothing you can do to really disabuse them of the notion, because really the kind of evidence that they, they want or that they use um, you know, isn't really isn't really amenable to kind of empirical inquiry. So if people believe in things like the unconscious, there's very little you can do uh, to disabuse them of the notion that such a thing exists. 
Um, I think the second is, the, sec the problem with the second, the reason why that's also circular, why I don't know if the question, is that um, what often happens in, in the search for validity is that what eth ethnographers do is they represent the data to the participants. And I think that is, is if you just re-describe participants' world to, worlds to them, they are quite likely to say, yes, that was me. So there is, there is a sort of, you know, kind of, it's kind of an easy way to pass the test of validity as demanded by the quantitative sociologists. But um, I don't think it necessarily says very much about the value of the redescriptions which are, which are generated. Actually, I'm going to come around to say that I think that, that the first problem, I don't really mind, because my sense is that theorists should not be subjected to empirical scrutiny, except only to small amounts of empirical scrutiny, and I think they should probably get away from the whole business of trying to um, uh, play nice with the empiricists. Okay. Um, So there's a sort of a crisis, I think, um, uh, and, and I think there are, there are a number of, of things that are, you know, not, haven't necessarily helped sociological theory. Um, I mean, I think you know, much sociological theory has failed. Uh, you know, Marxism is a, is a good example of that. But, um, and I don't really think that necessarily matters, you know, for reasons I, I've alluded to above which is that really sociology is not that interested in theory. So the fact that theory failed, I think, isn't really um, much, of a, much of a drama for it, because what, what empirical sociologists want is some kind of, um, uh, you know, a, just, a theoretical justification of what they do, so it kind of makes it look like the picture is complete. Um, but anyway, it can't have helped the fact that much sociological theory, um, you know, uh, fails ultimately. Um, and I don't think it's disconnection from empirical sociology is necessarily to blame, but again, I don't think that helped, because I think what began to happen in America was um, it became impossible to reproduce social theorists. As, uh, you know, they, they really were the, the elder, the elder um, academics, the older academics in, in the departments, and the younger people coming through, uh, you know, were captured by the Merton and Parsons project, and so people stopped doing um, social theory, sociology departments. And I don't think it's even especially connected to competition from other sorts of explanations, although, again, I don't think that helped. So what we're starting to see, I think, are, are a whole range of new fields, especially fields that begin with neuro, which are kind of competing for the sorts of explanations that sociologists once used to, um, once used to be able to use sort of, um, and have, uh, you know, it was kind of their, their sole territory. So you see, you know, things like neuroeconomics, for instance, <coughs> um, it might be possible to explain, um, you know, certain things like altruism, for instance, neurologically. And if that's the case, then it might, it, it's kind of quite dangerous, I think, for social sciences which want to have a kind of cultural explanation of these sorts of things. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that there, there aren't questions still to be answered by, um, uh, to be asked by sociologists, but clearly their, their ground will, will diminish if, as, um, uh, new kind of biological, genomic, and uh, you know the neuro world uh, takes off. So, so I mean, uh, you know, the, these I don't think have all necessarily led to the death of sociology, but none of them have um, have really helped. Um, where, where sociology has survived, actually, I think, is that it's sort of um, sorry, where social theory has survived, I think, or sociological theory has survived, is that it's moved outside of sociology. And, um, you know, as I said to you, I think sociology was really dead in the 1980s, at least bibliometrically. And what social theory began to do, or sociological theory began to do, was, was to move into other fields, which were often kind of cannibalised from sociology. Um, so I think it's feminist and cultural studies and, and so on. And now I think you tend to find sociological theory much more like to find it in, in the philosophy department, uh, or in a history Department than you are in a in a sociology department, and um, you know, Kathy alluded to what's happened to uh, um, QUT. You know, there is no sociology at QUT, so there's this weird thing where I'm a sort of social theorist, and I have no um, I have no home at, at QUT. Come to Come to Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to um, speak to me afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big pile of money. And, they combine. And so like I mean, the number of faculty younger than Rena. Ah. Getting bigger. 
Sorry, Kim. That's okay. No, I think, um, you know, my, my sense is that maybe what we should do is we should think about abandoning uh, sociology and let it carry on with, you know, what I've, I've rather cruelly called there the pointless correlation of variables. Now, um, I, haven't, I don't think I've really got time to talk much about this, but there's a nice paper by uh, Clark Glymore, which is back from 1983, called, um, I think it's called Social Science and Social Physics. It's a terrific paper which actually... Um, the, the, the method used is far too complicated for me, but it's a kind of uh, a set of, uh, what they do is they kind of partial all possible variables in, in classic sociological experiments. So what they do is they look at some of the classic sociological experiments and essentially re-examine them and look at every possible variable that could matter. Um, and then they work out the ones which, um, you know, with, with kind of modern computing techniques, they're able to show how some variables uh, um, you know, are actually wrongly selected. So, for instance, they looked at a classic from, I think, 67, Blau and Duncan's, um, what's it called, American Occupation, or the Great American Occupation. How can you know? No, I can't remember. Anyway, Blau and Duncan, which is one of the classics in sociology. And their findings were that Blau and Duncan got every variable wrong, that every variable they said mattered when you subject it to this enormous kind of massive, you know, multiple regression analysis of every possible variable. They missed all the ones that really mattered, and the ones that they focused on were ones which didn't matter at all, which were trivial correlations or were not correlations at all. So, look, if one thinks such a groundbreaking study as Blau and Duncan is completely wrong and is just, just, just completely missed the point, it doesn't really hold out much, I don't really hold out much enthusiasm for most of the kind of um, uh, empirical variable correlation that goes on in mainstream sociology. But, okay, so I'm sorry, I haven't really got time to go and have a look at that, so it's um, social science and social physics. So perhaps we should um, abandon uh, sociology, um, and, and it seems to me that maybe if we reconceptualise theory as a humanistic venture, <coughs> Steve Turner calls this commentary, essentially says what all the great social theorists have done and still do is, is a type of commentary. So if, even if you look at, say, someone like Marx, you know, Marx's work has to be understood as, a, as an engagement with previous commentary and previous social theory, the work of people like Hegel, for instance. And, you know, and similarly, Althusser's work then is an engagement with Marx's work. None of this work actually really requires any data, or it requires minimal data. If you, again, if you look at the absolute classics of sociology, you know, Durkheim's suicide, for instance, there were just a series of tables which were freely available to everybody. He didn't really do any empirical data selection. He just got some really standard stuff and he used it to start thinking. Similarly, uh, if you look at Weber's work, for instance, on the, on the Protestant work ethic, it's really work where empirical data is no help to you. If you, wanted to, you, you could empirically test the, pro, pro, the Protestant work ethic, but it really wouldn't tell you anything. So you could get a series of people together and see if there's a correlation between you know, forms of religiousness and forms of, you know, understanding about the world. But really, Weber's work isn't about correlating one type of attitude with one type of behaviour. It's about something more general. So I don't think you could really prove or disprove Weber's work on the Protestant work. Really, I think, and, and I suppose this is what increasingly I encourage my PhD students to do, is that, you know, sometimes they come to me and say, oh, I'd like to do this survey or this study, whatever. I say, there's absolutely no point. Everything that we need to know about the social world is already out there. There's no point in collecting data. What you should do is engage in commentary, <coughs> where you engage with the classics and you engage with the more recent um, uh, attempts to sort of study the classics. Marx, Weber and Durkheim, then, I think, are the point of entry to this new venture, which I don't know why I would call it. It's something like sociological theory in a philosophy department or something, or sociological theory as a, as a humanities discipline. So we have much more in common now, I think, with philosophy and history than we do with sociology, and that's probably where, where we should be. I hope that's what's going to happen in your new, your new fantasy. Yeah. So as I say, I think, and, the, and this is a point I've really alluded to already, I think Beck is wrong, because I think theory is a mature field with a set of social problems. I really don't see any especially new problems that you know, Beck's work is meant to address. Obviously, what Beck does is he says, everything has changed. You know, now everything is about risk. Very interestingly, I'll draw from the work of um, one of my PhD students, Jerry Donoghue, was, was incensed by Beck's claim that risk is this new thing. And she's working on risk in the 15th century. Risk was a massive problem for Machiavelli and the Machiavellians. You know? So Beck's idea, oh, well, you know, everything's risk now. We've got to 
class doesn't matter, um, uh, you know, wealth doesn't matter, none of these things really matter. All, all that matter is this is absolute nonsense. So I think the sorts of problems which social theory deals with, should deal with sociological theory, you know, problems like um, uh, individual morality, democracy, liberalism and so on, these, these problems are already established. And I think our best way to think about them isn't to collect data, which won't help us at all, but is to engage in a type of commentary where we engage with the classics and with those people who have, again, I'll draw from Steve Turner, here's a lovely phrase which I like, the people who've moved, moved the furniture around. Mm -hmm. So his argument, I suppose, is that a lot of the, the major theoretical problems were established by the classic thinkers like Zimmel and Durkheim and so on, and what mostly later thinkers do, people like Habermas and Gibbons and Foucault, is they actually look at exactly the same problems. Um, you know, Foucault's idea of the constituted nature of culture is exactly the same as Durkheim. There's a few little shifts and changes, but really, there's not. A, I, you know, you can overstate the differences between Foucault and Durkheim. I think. Which I probably shouldn't say. Some of the people still working on Foucault. I, I mean, uh, you know, you know, it's um, you know, C. Wright Mills, um, uh, you know, study has become a big shot in sociology. And it's very interesting to look at the, the careers of Mills and his co-writer Goethe. Hans Goethe, who was a... Yeah, yeah, I've nearly done that. Hans Goethe, who was the sort of really boring Germanic scholar, and C. Wright Mills, who studied how to be a hotshot. And Mills became the superstar, and Goethe became someone who no one was really that interested in. So I probably shouldn't say things like that about him. Um, if I'd studied my Mills, I'd be saying, you know, this is true, except for Foucault, who has changed everything. <laughs> OK, um, I probably won't take that two minutes, Cathy, because I had about a million other things here I was going to say. But what, I won't get started. I think, have I, have, has it been provocative enough, or do I need to say something ruder? I think there's some more rude things to say. <laughs> Hang on, let me see. American Occupational Structure, that was Blau and Duncan, 1967. Um, yeah, I, I think, no, I think I'll leave it at that, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you.